Grace and peace to everyone that's coming in. Welcome. So glad that you're joining us. Thank you most of all for your patience. Going to share with you exactly in a little bit why you uh, were delayed for about 10 minutes or so. But once again, welcome. So glad that you're here. Why don't you make yourself available in the chat to send a word of greeting and, and share uh, and, and, and share where, where you are right now, what you're doing. Are you having some tea? Are you having some coffee perhaps in the afternoon? Are you cooking and listening to us? And that's why you can't chat. Why don't you let us know uh, what it is that you are cooking up there? Uh, once again, so glad you are here. Welcome, Yvain. Welcome so much, Robin. Welcome to Pearl. Welcome, Michael. Welcome, welcome, Linda. Welcome, Kenrick. Welcome, welcome so much. It's so glad you guys are here and you are here with us, and we are continuing to let folks in. So I'm just going to continue to talk for a minute until we fill up, and I'm just grateful that you are here. On behalf, Welcome on behalf of the New School of Biblical Theology. Welcome on behalf of uh, our founder and president, Dr. A.R. Bernard. We are grateful that you have chosen to spend this afternoon with us. And again, please uh, send us a note in the, in the chat. Send us a word in the chat. Uh, why don't you say hello to somebody that you see online? Once again, Brian, welcome. Uh, once again, welcome to uh, Alonzo. Welcome, Alonzo. Welcome, and I see the reactions. It is good to see you all. And uh, and listen, I'm 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 trying to send you some warmth from Florida for all your folks up there in the East Coast, uh, up, up there in the Northeast. I'm trying to send you some warmth, but it's a little cool down here. Believe it or not, I'm blaming all of you. I left new part of the reason I know that the Lord had me leave was because of my many lamentations to him about the cold and about the snow. But I am grateful that you are all here, uh, family. And I just want to just share with you as we get started, uh, once again, that we are grateful that you are here to join us in this afternoon part of our conversation series. And I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Hogan to open us up in prayer, and then I'll let you know exactly why we're why we got started a little bit late. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Go ahead, Dr. Hogan. Thank you, Dr. Nario. Let's bow our spirits before God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come together as a community of learners. We thank you for this afternoon. We thank you, Lord God, for your word and wisdom that will flow today, oh Father, and that we will receive it, Lord God, with understanding. We thank you for each and every participant. We thank you for our panelists. And we thank you for all you are doing for NSBT. Father, we ask that during this time, you will receive all the glory as we continue to learn, grow, and apply all that you give to us. And all these things, we give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Once again, thank you all for being here with us. And I just want to share with you, number one, we apologize for starting late, but our reason was we were reaching out and being uh, gracious to uh, our key speaker, Dr. Archie Wright, who was scheduled to be with us. Uh, unfortunately, he's dealing with some things with his mother and her health. And he really took the assignment. We took it all together by faith and kind of say, okay, we believe that you're going to be available to share. Um, and we also just want to share, we don't want to give any details, but even some of our other staff members were hit this afternoon with some things that uh, remind us that we don't wrestle uh, against flesh and blood. And But at the same time, uh, I've learned in life from Dr. Bernard that everything in life is a test. And so we want to have a conversation with you. We want to have a conversation with you right now. We're flipping the subject. So maybe uh, we want to encourage you to just tune in for a little bit as we flip the subject a little bit, talk about uh, Christ and culture, talk about how that is connected to spiritual warfare, talk about as well just the vision of the seminary. Uh, because again, I just want to remind you, we were supposed to talk about angels, demons, and we got hit with them in a span of two days. Uh, and, and so we seem to be uh, in that place where we're being pressed in, but you know what? By the grace of God, we are not crushed. And uh, we're grateful that you are here. We know that you have questions. We're going to be hoping to get to some of those questions as well about spiritual warfare, about angels, about demons. We'll see whether or not we can actually address some of them. But I actually want to introduce to you someone who I admire greatly. He is the director of strategic planning. He is the professor of world Christianity. So he can go ahead and unmute. And I want to introduce him because he is a treasure 
to the kingdom and I'm grateful that he's here. And I just want to say, I want to, I want to try to help make him famous. He keeps resisting me. So I want you all to pray, pray that we can just, just make this brother famous. Praise him, more famous than he already is. Go ahead, Dr. Irvin, please share. Thank you. You can all hear me. I'm trying hard to remain unfamous. I'm trying to keep in the backgrounds. And, <clears throat> uh, but Dr. O just keeps pulling me out. Hey, everybody, thank you for being here tonight. Yeah, I'm not Archie Wright, and I don't do angels very well, and I don't do the demons either, but he really wrestles with that stuff. Um, so I would just like to stop and pray for him right now, and whatever is happening around his life with his mother, with his family, I just ask you, Lord, please to lift him up, uh, protect him, protect his family, give him strength, give him wisdom. We know that he would only miss this because something has come up as an emergency, and we ask this in Christ's name, that you keep us you keep him in your presence and keep him with empowered with your spirit. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. So uh, it's just been thrown to me to talk about the uh, cultural engagement. Christian Cultural Center was never named, was only named that in 2000, 1991. The name was originally different. And in, and in 2000, in 1999, A.R. Bernard, change the name of the church as they were moving in transition into Christian Cultural Center. The question is, what is all that about and why Christian Cultural Center? If you've seen some of the material over the years, you've seen some of the, the conversations with him. Air Bernard was in a conversation with Mayor Koch back in 1986. Those of you who've been in New York City long enough to remember Mayor Edward Koch, remember 1980s, and Koch was in the uh, was in the driver's seat. Uh, Air Bernard was an up and coming pastor. Uh, the church was gaining strength. He was invited in by Mayor Koch to a meeting, and I believe it was 1986. <clears throat> You'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the 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 mayor was talking about Muslim and Jewish culture, but not inviting Christians to the table to talk about the culture of the city. And Air Bernard said to him, why do you not invite Christians? And he said, because Christians don't have a culture. You're a religion. Muslims and Jews are a culture. That set him thinking and set him re going. <clears throat> and he's talked about this a number of times. Um, he's written about it. It took him back to H. Richard Niebuhr's Christ and Culture from 1951. And that set him in motion in creating what eventually became Christian Cultural Center, a, a community which is not focused inside the walls of the church, a church which sees itself moving outside the walls into the city. Um, he's always said that the church doesn't live behind four walls. It doesn't live inside its own little cubicle. It's got to get out. It's got to get out. The reason is because Jesus was not about just simply staying inside the synagogue. Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God and it was about coming out into the world. The kingdom of God is not located in the church. It's located in the world. And he picked that up and ran with it. Um, Niebuhr's Christ and Culture was an extraordinary book in the 50s. In the context, you got to put him in context. It was, it was the middle of the, it was right after World War II. Western civilization had just gone through Nazis. They were facing the Cold War. Niebuhr was, is European-American. Niebuhr comes from a German background. His first name is Helmut, and he would never use that name because he always used H. Richard because Richard was Anglo and Helmut was German, and he didn't want people to know they had a German background. H. Richard Niebuhr wrote that book in 1951, struggling with what does it mean to be a Christian in an age which is increasingly secular and increasingly um, struggling with the question of how do Christians engage responsibly in culture, no longer being in charge of things, no longer being the ones who run Western culture. So they're no longer the enforcers of culture, but they are the informers of a culture. Um, one of the key pieces in Niebuhr's work, I tell everybody we go through the class, you got to keep watching this. Niebuhr was a European American. He lived in New Haven. I have no evidence he ever stepped foot into one of the black churches in New Haven. And there's some fabulous ones. So his perspective on culture was European American culture, but that doesn't limit him. That doesn't, that doesn't 
that doesn't rule him out. It means we work with him in terms of his own context. Um, Niebuhr identified what he called the enduring problem of Christians facing culture. And the enduring problem is this. For Niebuhr, Jesus Christ was the second member of the Trinity. He had a very high Christology. Um, Christ was without sin. He believed in a sinless Christ in his humanity. He affirmed Chalcedon. Jesus Christ is fully divine and fully human. But Christ for him represented God. He was, he was a very, very high Christology. When you want to talk about God for Niebuhr, Niebuhr talks about Christ. But Niebuhr said, Christ points us to the Father, not to himself. And the Father immediately points us back to the world that he so loved and created. And so Niebuhr came up with this notion of what he calls the enduring problem. And the enduring problem is this. A sinless Christ kicks us back out into a sinful culture. Now, why is culture sinful? Niebuhr argued that culture was created by human beings, and human beings are, by definition, infected by original sin, which means the enduring problem is that you've got to relate a sinless Christ to a sinful culture. At times, Niebuhr came really close to making the church sinless. It, it, he gets confused at times. So the church, but, but other times he's really clear about it. The church is a place of culture. It's not sinless. And the problem is, he says, that the church can be a place where culture gets sanctified. And some of you know this. You've come from churches that are, that are holiness, sanctified folks, where the, the saints in the church can't sin. And those churches can often become places that have great toxicity. The, the church itself becomes toxic. Yeah. because it thinks it is above sin and the church itself is living in history. And that means it's human. It's a human institution. That means it's going to be affected by sin. That was neighbor's enduring problem. How do we relate Christ who's sinless to culture, to human culture that is sinful? Some want to talk about the world and the world outside. Niebuhr said, that's fine. That's the early Christian response. That's his Christ against culture. He said, the problem is, I'm going to be I'm going to paraphrase. He never said this, but I say it. Christians, you all wear your clothes when you come to church. You don't come in naked. You put some clothes on and those clothes were not made by Christ. Those clothes were made by Louis Vuitton or Macy's. You bought them in Macy's. You buy your clothes in the same place as other people buy their clothes. You probably drove to CCC in a car. That car was made not by Christians, but by GM, by somebody else, by Toyota. He says Christians cannot avoid living in the world. You use language, and the language we're, we're using in the church is not Hebrew and Greek, the language of the Bible. We're using English, Spanish, uh, Twi. We're using, we're, using, we're using African languages. Christianity has always been translated into new cultural forms, and that for him was the enduring problem, is that it had to deal with the fact that culture is not sinless, but culture is a human construction, but the church itself has to live that out. That then invited him to a notion of cultural engagement, that we really want to get out into the world, get out of the church, get into the world, and figure out how do we engage the world responsibly, not being assimilated into the culture, but at the same time not being totally separated. Because you can't separate from culture. And... You don't want to be an informer of culture, an enforcer of culture, sorry, an enforcer. This was the great mistake of Western Christendom from the 1100s through the early modern period where the church thought it could run the society. The church was in charge. Um, people, that gave us the Inquisition. That gave us burning heretics. And it was the Baptist and the Anabaptist who were burned last by Lutherans and, and Calvinists and, and, and Catholics. Uh, even John Calvin oversaw the execution of Michael Servetus in Geneva in the middle of the 1500s. Um, I don't want Christians to run the government again because they tend to burn heretics when they did. But how do you inform the government without trying to enforce it? How do you inform business? How do you become someone who influences and informs and shapes 
the, the areas of civic life, of, of government life, of commercial life, without becoming a, a, a servant of them, at the same time without entirely divorcing yourself from them. My classes, I always tell the students, I used to go down to Philadelphia to the, to the uh, Reading Market, and the Amish, who are the, 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 the most perfect um, 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 illustration of Christ against culture in the modern era, they live on their own farms, they live in their own community, they separate themselves from the world, but they, they have to make a living. And so they would make pies and bring them to the Reading Market and sell them downtown Philadelphia. And one time I got into this wonderful conversation with, a, with an Amish farmer. And I said, you're Amish. You don't believe in driving motorized vehicles, only horse and buggies. And he said, that's right. But I said, how do you get your farms, your, your pies here to F Philadelphia? You don't take a horse and buggy from Lancaster. And he said, no, when we get to the edge of our community, the rules go off and we're allowed to drive pickup trucks. So we keep the pickup trucks parked outside the, the local community and we load them up and drive them in here to Philadelphia. Um, I, I thought that's amazing. You can be Christ against culture in your own community as long as you don't go outside the, the boundaries, as long as you don't go outside the, the local church. It works if you only live in the church, but guess what, people? You can't just live in the church. You've got to get out into the world. Amen. That's where the Christ and culture question comes into to play. Over the years, I've loved watching Arab Bernard. Um, I was there when he was installed for the, for the um, presidency of the um, 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 City Council of Churches. He told the congregation that night that you're going to see some things you've not expected. We're on a journey here. Over the years, he's been extraordinarily engaged with the multi-faith conversation in New York City. He's always been part of the mayor's breakfast, the mayor's prayer breakfast when they had them, when the mayors had them in New York, uh, the multi-faith breakfast at the beginning of the year. Um, he's got an extraordinary relationship with the Jewish community, with Joe Potasnik in particular, but the entire Jewish community. When I listen to him, I hear him working with, I can, I can put him into Niebuhr's categories, but never one. And it always is driven by the local situation. Sometimes he sounds like somebody who is engaging in transformation. Sometimes he's willing to recognize the paradox that government and, and the city the, the, and the church um, don't exactly line up. And there are places where you respect the law of the state, but you don't give into it. At the same time, you 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 engage it and you you follow it. Um, you might be a Christian, but the Holy Ghost doesn't give you permission to run red lights. Um, you follow the law of the city, the follow the law of the state. The law of the state says there's a speed limit. You can't come be a Christian and say, okay, I, that doesn't apply to me because I'm a Christian. I'm not bound by the state. I can speed as much as I want. No, it's, it's, that harms other people. Underneath that, in this whole conversation, is an ongoing driving issue I, I love that. That's hypocrisy. Yeah, that's religiosity is hypocrisy. Underneath it is a driving issue that's been part of the CCC ethos for the last, I don't know, three decades. And that is that finally Christians are about the common good. They're about looking at the culture around them and saying that the Holy Spirit is working in the world. There's, there's truth. There's beauty. There's, there's the, the Spirit is at work in the wider world of nations. The grounding for that theologically is Genesis 1:26 to 28. The image of God is found in all human beings, and the the the, the sin of the of, of Adam and Eve cannot erase the image of God because the image of God is already in there. It yep. can distort it, it can cloud it, but it can't erase it. There's an original goodness which continues to find its way through expression, and it finds its way through expression not because of human capacity, but because of the divine capacity of the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, um, Vincent Baycote calls this common grace. He gets it from, from, from um, um, uh, Abraham Kuyper, John Calvin. You've heard Vincent Baycote talk about this in our webinars. Um, this is the grace of the Holy Spirit, which is given to all creation. It's the grace of law. It's the grace of beauty. It's the grace of art. It's the grace of truth. There are elements of it, 
And the church's responsibility, the church's call is not just simply to displace human culture, but to engage it and to bring it through to what it is all about and what God intends for all human creation. Final word, and then we'll, we'll kick back to, uh, I'll let you all talk. I don't think there's one Christian culture. I don't think there's one, I don't think the kingdom of God speaks one language. I think the kingdom of God is going to be pluralistic in language. I think all the tribes are going to keep their identity. In the book of Revelation, there's not just one tribe. Everybody, all of our differences and all of our diversity remains, but it, it remains sanctified. It will come through. It will be brought through to its conclusion to what God intends it. And I think this is really important in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, they were all Jews on the day of Pentecost who spoke different languages, but they were Jews from different parts of the world. In the day of book of Revelation, they are people who are Gentiles who speak different languages and who are now coming up to Jerusalem, to the new Jerusalem, to worship God. And what you see in the New Testament is a progression from the notion of the diversity of Judaism to the incoming of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles continue to, to keep their own culture, their own identities, and find ways to worship God in each of them. So that's part of what we do in, 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 in world Christianity. It's part of what we're working on. How do we uh, um, embrace and recognize and transform cultures, not just our own, but those of others? And how do we participate in a movement which, in the end of the day, was not going to all speak one language, but it's going to have all of the languages of the world praising God in our diverse language, in our diverse voices? Amen. That's my summary, real quick. Well, listen, can you give a virtual round of applause to Dr. Irvin real quick as we prepare just to ask a few questions and uh, thank you all again for being here. I wanna remind you uh, before I continue to please, uh, if you've never been to an, an NSBT informational, I will be hosting one this Thursday on February 9th. So please make sure that you registered for that. I just sent it into the chat. Uh, the link. So you can please feel free to copy that information or check your emails. Uh, and all that Dr. Urban is saying here is important for us. And I just want to also just speak on behalf of Pastor Bernard, something that he's always, we always said is that he always, it's always about also maintaining the Christian distinction. And so we want, you know, Pastor Bernard said he mentors politicians. He, we, you know, we want to have those who are going to be faithful to Christ and faithful to the spirit of servant leadership. Um, I think that uh, I, 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 some, so often we end up embodying the, 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 the spirit of a different type of a leader other than Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I, I see that, for instance, in my own cultural context, where you can have someone who, because the position is understood to be a servant, they, they're an usher and they're, and they get along fine as an usher and everyone thinks they're fine as an usher, but the minute they become a deacon, um, they become a dictator. And in becoming a dictator, it's because their, their archetype for leadership comes from something other than Jesus. They can't picture Jesus handling power, dealing with power, being, uh, being someone who knows how to make these decisions for the benefit of others in that context. And that's what we are we are working on, you know, and, and that's what we're here to uh, to be part of that discipleship process yep. in yep. your lives. Yep. Uh, that's yep. why we're working on the School yep. of Ministry, which we pray that you will stay in tune with that. If a commitment to the seminary is not uh, doable, that's what we're working on, that certificate program that we're looking to offer as well. Um, Dr. Urban, though, um, for those who may not know, you talked about Niebuhr really quickly. Can you, can you really quickly just bullet point some of those those perspectives on how Christians have engaged culture. Yeah, so yeah, there's, yeah. there's, there, you know, just really quickly, just because yeah. there are different perspectives and you touched on them. If those yeah. are the, the yeah. folks that were listening um, yeah. and, 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 and we're catching that, but some of the perspectives that, that are there, that, um, that they're familiar with as well. What are some yeah. of those perspectives? Yeah. So uh, Niebuhr identified five basic types. He called them types. He's a, he's working in sociology here. They're not exact. They're never, they're, they always got fuzzy boundaries. But his basic type was, he said, the early Christian movement from the days of the disciples was Christ against culture. And he picks that up and runs it through history. Tolstoy, 
um, a, a, a Tertullian in the second century, Tolstoy in the 19th century. I put the Amish in that today. Right. That is that Christ opposes everything in the world and in culture. And the only way to be saved is to separate yourself. The problem he says in there is the main problem in Christ against culture is that God's love only extends to other Christians. So that the, 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 the commandment to love your neighbor is translated into love your own fellow Christians and don't love anybody else. Right. And of course, once that begins to happen, you begin to see churches that do this, that they, they begin to close in on themselves. Um, the Christ against culture, number one, is, is, he says, an early one, but it was impossible to sustain because Christians found even Tertullian, who is the main exponent of Christ against culture, has to use Stoic philosophy to make his argument. Right. So he's drawing on his own cultural background. The second one he says is Christ of culture. And this one he really identifies with 19th century liberalism, but also with Gnosticism. And that simply dissolves Christ into the culture. So the first one is Christ against culture, which emphasizes his divinity and ignores his humanity. The second one is the Christ of culture, which emphasizes his humanity and denies his divinity or ignores his divinity. Uh, the Christ of culture simply says whatever happens in a, in a Christian culture is good. Um, you can see all of the problems that that's going to create because it turns the church loose and says you don't have any kind of critical place. So then he offers three that he says are what he calls the, the, the three more complex ones. The, the third one is Christ above culture. He identifies that with Thomas Aquinas, and that's a synthesis. Thomas Aquinas says, grace does not contradict nature, it perfects it. And Christ was sent to perfect our human culture. And so that means you start with your culture, with where you are, and the Christians go to work in the world and they begin to, 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 uh, transform to 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 in, encourage it and to bring it forward to what it was its own inner realization. The fourth type he turns to is is Luther. Luther said, "Look, Romans 13, God said, obey the state. The state has laws." Luther said, "If your ruler is not a Christian, you're still in, required by God to obey your 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 government, even if it's not a Christian." Luther once said, I would rather be ruled by a competent Muslim than an incompetent Christian. When it comes to governance, God governs the world through laws, through, through, through agencies, and they need to be obeyed. But that doesn't mean you're a Christian that you give in and you, ca and you, 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 you capitulate when it comes to your faith. And so Luther set up Christ and culture in a kind of paradox. So Luther's great example was you're an army chaplain you're an army you're an army you're an army soldier you're the, the church is being attacked you're a police officer your job is to go in there and stop the attacker even if it means taking a life but now you're a pastor and luther said the pastor does never the gospel is never defended by violence so if your church is being attacked and you're a pastor your job is to get on your knees and pray now, the problem is when you're a pastor and a police officer, and you occupy both, that's where Luther says there's paradox, and you've got to, do, you've got to work that through. Um, he calls it a dualist position, a paradoxical position, and that's that the world has its own, uh, its own uh, 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 legitimacy, its own autonomy. The church has its autonomy. We've got to figure out how do we work them. That is really what Abraham Kuyper was about. He called it sphere sovereignty. Sometimes when you're in government and you're a Christian, you have to make decisions that you don't like making, but it's part of the government, part of the common good. Niebuhr's last category was Christ, the transformer of culture, and he turned to the reform tradition, especially Calvin and others, and said, here, Christ is Lord of all creation, not just of the church. And that the tri Christ is transformer of culture calls Christians to engage the culture, to become a, a, a conversionist to convert the culture to something better and to bring it through to what God intends. Niebuhr said those last three were all viable. They were all dynamic. The first two he considered fairly static and unworkable because you really can't 
either be, as I said, Christians don't go into church Sunday morning naked. They put clothes on and those clothes came from their culture. Um, on the other hand, when they only go in dressing like the culture, then they fall into the, to the way in which I've seen this happen, in which churches become places where people celebrate their wealth and their status and don't actually listen to what God is saying to them in the world. Um, those other three for Niebuhr were, were the ones that he said were the, the most viable. I see all of them at work. Yeah, uh, yeah. When I hear when I hear A.R. Bernard on Sunday mornings talking about the city, I hear the Christ and culture and a kind of a dualistic, uh, a, a, a paradoxical condition. When I hear him preach about the transformative work, I hear that. And there are times when he talks about um, the common good where he's falling back on Thomas Aquinas. Yep. So he's merging. He's work. He's, he's merging all three of those categories looking at situations when we are called it sometimes at work you'll be in a place where you'll be asked to do something and you say which is simply dishonest and you'll say at this point i need to say no uh, i need to be a christ transforming culture at other points you'll take a decision and say um i will i'm going to be i'm going to recognize that i've got to work with people who i don't agree with their politics uh, for the common good and that's going to be christ and culture and paradox yeah, um, yeah. So all of them are, are at work at all times. And Niebuhr was never saying only one of them, but be aware of how you're engaging the culture and how you're engaging the world. And to do so knowing that finally, um, for Niebuhr, the final goal is to bring about the kingdom of God on earth, but God's going to bring that about, not us. Right, right, and, right, right. And now someone asked the question, how does culture relate to God's kingdom? And I'd love for you to fill this in. I just want to just share well, off the top of my head, one of the things that just to remind everyone of what Pastor Bernard has taught us at the Christian Cultural Center, where God's kingdom is God's way of thinking, doing, and being. And so there's the reign of God through in, in Christ, in our hearts, in our minds. So the the how the kingdom then relates to culture, uh, one of those what is is exactly what we're being what we're fleshing out here. There are going to be those times when if you have the mind of Christ, there are some things to be against. There are going to be those things then that you're going to have to live in paradox about. And then there are those things where you where God will inspire you to bring about transformation. You want to share a little bit more about that, that relationship between sure. the kingdom? You, you shared it just now because Niebuhr sure. said he believed that the ultimate fullness of the kingdom will come through Christ. But right. in the meantime, we are working right. that out. Right. The book of Revelation, I think, is one of the most important pieces in the Bible for this. It's a city. The kingdom is a city, finally. On um, the book of Revelation, the angel is giving a measurement tape, giving a, giving a tape measure to the seer and says, go and measure the wall. Um, there's going to be building codes in the kingdom of God. There's going to be not everybody who comes into the kingdom of God will be healed already. There will be healing going on. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the tree for the leaves of healing by the river of paradise at the center of the garden. In, 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 the, in the kingdom of God, the, the leaves of the trees will be for the healing of the nations. So there's ongoing healing. There's a healthcare system. There's a there's a, a, a there, there's building measurement systems. There, there, there's building codes, and certainly there's worship going on. But the most interesting thing is there's no temple, and so that the whole city is infused with the light of God's grace. That notion of a of a of a kingdom of God of a city of God is fully enculturated. It's not just stripped off ghost floating through the, the atmosphere. Um, ministry gifts as well as natural gifts. Right, good, very good. That's a wonderful post from ministry gifts, natural gifts, we'll be exercising them, people will be going to work. There's a, there's a sense that the city itself becomes a place which is transformed and is sacred, but it doesn't strip it of its culture. And then finally, uh, at the end of 21, it says, and all the nations will come up with all their languages. So we'll see the diversity of cultures continuing. Everybody's not going to become one culture. We're not all going to be reduced to speaking English. Uh, hallelujah. There'll be Spanish and Chinese and, German, and, and, and other languages spoken in the kingdom of God. Um, not everybody necessarily will be um, um, eating the same foods and living the same ways, but there'll be a, a, a diversity of cultural life. The key here is that human culture is not going to be wiped out 
But right. human culture is itself an expression of the image of God given yeah. to us in first in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And part of the commandment to go and be fruitful and multiply, that's not just simply to have domination, but it's to create culture. It's to create human beings or, the, or create life beyond just simply what we're given in our natural birth state. Yeah. Amen. Um, Amen. And in doing that, all of that is not evil, but it needs to be transformed. There's good and there's sin. They both travel along together, but but the but the, the the work of grace is to transform that finally, into that the sin is wiped out. That what is left and what emerges is something which is good, universally good for all people. Uh, you know, Doctor Irvin, you you uh, one of the things we teach uh, for everyone who's watching uh, on the master's level is a course that you also designed, interreligious living. Mm -hmm. um I, I i love if you could tease a little bit on that course just from the perspective of there's something that i've always fascinated with the students that i advise where they go through some kind of really almost a semi-existential crisis where there 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 is there is an awareness of and i forget the terminology you you used implicit versus i guess uh it has to do with their faith the awareness mm -hmm. of 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 because we're talking about culture but so often what can end up happening is by default, I think we, we, we veer toward Christ of culture. Mm -hmm. So by default, worship for me is this certain type of music, right? By by default communion for me is, right. it's gotta be the grape juice. I can't have wine for some reason. Right. I can't have wine, you know, for, for, right. you know, for my, my default is I got to dress a certain way. My default is I, I, I have to pray a certain way. It's always interesting for me as well that during the season of Lent, um, Minister Misha and myself, you know, taking from the Book of Common Prayer, re uh, rewriting some of those, Minister Misha's rewritten a lot of those prayers, but in rewriting them, I we, we, we've kept a lot of the Trinitarian formula of prayer, you know, <laughs> and that Trinitarian formula for some folks, we've gotten some like, hey, why are we praying this way? Where's the you know, in those prayers, we, you know, you know, we're addressing God, the father, and we're saying, you know, through, you know, uh, uh, through Christ, the son, by the Holy Spirit. So can you just share in an interreligious living? That's one of the things we touch on, which is making people aware of, of that aspect of their worldview. Sure, sure. So to start, nowhere in the New Testament is it ever assumed that before Christ comes again, the whole world will become Christian. Uh, it's assumed from the very beginning that there will be non-Christians all the way along. It doesn't mean we don't invite people in. It means that the invitation is a sharing. The invitation is a welcome to come in, but not everybody's going to come in. Um, Paul, on the other hand, says in the end, Christ will be all in all and will turn everything over to God. And Paul really has a very strong uh, language about all. Um, this is... Um, this is just part of the Pauline tradition. So interreligious living says that let's let Jesus figure out. This is this is John Wesley. John Wesley said, when it comes to other religions, I have no authority from the word of God to say whether God will exclude them or not. There's grace in all cultures. The Holy Spirit was at work in creation. <clears throat> let God be the judge of others. Wesley said the problem is Christians want to judge others. They don't want to judge themselves. We've, we are the ones who have the Bible. We are the ones who have the words of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, Sermon on the Mount about what we're supposed to do. And John Wesley said, if Christians fail to follow Christ and obey and put his words into action, they will be judged by that. That he knows from Scripture. So he says, let Jews, Muslims, Hindus, let God work with them. We will reach out to them. We will speak to them about it. But if they decide not to, that's that's for reason. Karl Rahner was an, a major 20th century Roman Catholic theologian, an enormous impact. Karl Rahner once wrote an essay in which he said there are people who are not Christians who have rejected Christ, not because they have rejected the true Christ. They have rejected the Christ that the church has preached to them. In the church over the last 500 years, Protestant as well as Catholic, has brought a Christ who has been often identified with colonial power, with violence. Christians themselves have failed to live out the life of Christ. And Rahner said there are people who reject Christ, 
not because they reject the true Christ, but they reject the Christ who has been represented to them. And God will not hold their atheism against them. God will hold it against the Christians who, pre who claim to be the missionaries and to be the evangelist. I find that to be one of the most powerful statements of theology, that there are people who reject Christ precisely because they know something about Christ that cannot be held true, cannot be true. Um, that interreligious living starts with the openness to the fact that, that, that Christ might be known among others in ways that I don't understand that I might not know the fullness of Christ yet in my own church tradition. We forget the fact that we call the movement evangelical, but for Calvin and Luther, evangelicalism had to do with Christians because the Christians were not truly Christian and the people sitting in the churches were not yet Christian. That's why Calvin said every sermon has to be an evangelical sermon. It's not converting the non-believer. It's converting people who claim to be believers. And when Christians start living like Christian, like Christ called us to live, then the rest of the world will, will, will turn and, and begin to listen and learn. Um, that was Calvin's point. Um, I think that interreligious living starts with the notion that there is that there's a grace outside what I know in my own Christian experience, that God has not abandoned the world, and that I can continue to make my witness and share my faith without requiring the other become a Christian in order for me to work with that person. And so I'm, I'm engaged in a dialogue of life. I'm engaged in interreligious living. I'm engaged in the common good. Hey, my grandson showed up. That's Thomas, everybody. <clears throat> uh, Thomas is the youngest theologian in the, in the family, and he's our youngest NSBT student. <laughs> he is awesome. Yes, exactly. But, but, but it is learning to to not give up your faith and not abandon your faith um make it a public witness but at the same time not make it something which excludes the other but is a place where you are able to engage the other because ultimately it's about the common good yeah that's yeah. that's the key point no that's great uh dr Irvin, thank you so much dr hogan do you want to jump in here because i think dr Irvin has gotten listen there's a referee that jumps on the field <laughs> there's the time that's that's Thomas. Thomas has jumped on yes. the field, family. <laughs> Who has a Thomas at home? I want you to put it in the right now. And you got a Thomas at home. I got, yeah. I got a Thomas. He's bigger than that, but he's waiting outside the door, too. He's like, <laughs> just waiting. Hey, Thomas is showing off. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. So, doc, Dr. Irvin, yes. can we give Dr. Irvin a virtual round of applause, please? Thank you so much. Thank you so very, you very so much. much. This was impromptu. Yes. Uh, this, is, this is off the dome, as uh -huh. we say. This is off the dome. I don't know my brother's getting a little red there, but I'm going to, listen, I, I want to love on him. <laughs> yes. We celebrate you now, Dr. Irving. Absolutely. Thank you. thank you. I'm grateful for you. So Absolutely. thank you, Dr. Irving, for Absolutely. being here. Thank you. I'm going to let you. Dr. Hogan have the final word, but I know Thomas oh. is right behind you pulling your shirt. I know. We want to thank love you. on Thomas. And <laughs> uh, I appreciate you, Dr. Irving. And we'll thank see him Wednesday. Know. Very much. Yes, sir. We'll see you Wednesday. See All you right. Wednesday. Thank you so much, Dr. Irving. Um, and this is just a sample of the knowledge of this particular man. And uh, we are so blessed to have had him come on today, impromptu. Um, and so much of what he was talking about with Niebuhr, especially with his step six, was exactly what Pastor was talking about in his prayer at the Senate, yeah. which, was, which was Christ in culture, and him not saying Jesus at the end. There's a whole process to that. And, and that's something that uh, Dr. Irvin was talking about concerning Niebuhr. But our time has come to the end. We want to thank everyone for joining in. Um, and this uh, particular session series will be available um, on our website if you'd like to listen to it again for free. Um, we want to thank everyone. We want to uh, pray that you will continue to lift up um, our professors who are having some challenges with their families. Um, and we just thank everyone for being here today. Amen. Love you all. Amen. 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 Let's have this, this, this kind of benediction. Yes. And so may the, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord, bless us. Because if you bless us, we shall be blessed. Amen. Amen. And amen.
God bless you, family. Thanks again. See you all on Thursday, and God bless you. Grace and peace for being here. Thank you.